right, commitment. Not sure what goes through everybody's head when they hear that word. Sometimes it's not always the best of thoughts when you hear commitment. But uh, I got to share, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's my pleasure to be here this morning with everybody and uh, sharing this message about personal commitment and uh, continuing through this series about Nehemiah. And I don't know about you, but I think this has been a great series. Um, you know, we've talked in the past, uh, back during Pastor Appreciation, I mentioned that Pastor Tim has that ability to be able to talk to a whole bunch of people and yet still feel like he's talking right to you. And I know there have been a lot of Sundays where I've left here thinking uh, he was talking straight to me. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen uh, God moving. I know I've felt challenged. I've had multiple people come and tell me about some of the things that they really feel like God has been moving in in their life uh, through this series regarding Nehemiah. So uh, for those of you that have your Bibles, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 3. We're not going to go through the whole thing, but we'll get there eventually. We're going to also uh, cover some scripture uh, that we've already seen as a reminder about some things um, as well. But uh, We'll be in chapter 3 of Nehemiah here in just a little bit. And for those of you who are note takers, Pastor Tim was kind enough to help me out. And uh, you've still got your fill in the blank notes. So yay, for those of you that are uh, note takers, you can continue to work through that and follow along with that as well. So um, if we go ahead and we get into the message here, everything started with holy ambition. And... Uh, Holy ambition being that sacred, set-apart, strong desire to achieve something requiring determination and hard work. And off of holy ambition, once we talked about that, we found a series of, of things that Nehemiah has gone through, uh, starting with that dislocated heart where, where he saw a situation, the walls of Jerusalem, uh, destroyed, and he knew that this was something that he needed to move in. And through that dislocated heart, Nehemiah suffered a broken spirit. And that broken spirit uh, moved him so much that he sat down and wept, and we talked about that, mourned and fasted and prayed. And from that broken spirit, and through that time with God, Nehemiah then experienced radical faith where he was willing to take great personal risk and sacrifice and carry out what has been laid on his heart by God. And he displayed the type of faith, um, you know, that we called radical when he went to the king knowing that that may not end well. But he did it regardless because of that faith and because of, of, of that holy ambition that had been set a part of him. So then last week, Pastor Tim talked about once you've got that radical faith and you feel God moving behind you and pushing you and supporting you through that, how do we get a strategic plan in place to carry out that holy ambition? And, you know, he, he talked about Nehemiah not staying in the land of good intentions, um, I, loved, I loved the way that terminology went. He set a time. He asked for all that he needed. And he had a clear vision. And through that vision, he went and acquired all the necessary resources. He planned in private and then launched it in public. And that's what we're going to talk about today as Nehemiah has launched in public this plan. And that's where we want to be. We want to find out what it's like and what it looks like to unlock the power of personal commitment. And that, in turn, is what sees that strategic plan through. But, like I mentioned a little bit ago, the problem is you hear the word commit sometimes, and uh, it, it can be a little bit intimidating. Uh, you know, the dictionary defines commitment as the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or activity. And... You know, when Pastor Tim first talked to me about bringing this message, um, I, was, uh, I was pumped. It was, I thought, this is awesome. God is, this is perfect, God. This personal commitment, you know, 
many years ago and a few pounds ago, I was an athlete. You know, I know about personal commitment, and I coach. And, you know, my players, if you talk to some of the players at Norway, they'd probably say, oh, yeah, he's preached on personal commitment before, trust me. And I thought, this is perfect. And, you know, when you, when you think about personal commitment and you look for an example, um, you think about people that you've come in contact with and that you've been around in your life and so forth. When I sat down and I started thinking about this, there was one man outside of my father that had a greater influence on me than anybody I've ever had. And his name was Steve Lloyd. He was my basketball coach when I was a junior. And he came to us um, after coaching with Bobby Huggins at the University of Akron. And he came in and, you know, he was this D1 assistant coach and so forth. And you never know what you're going to get. But the first thing I heard about him was because was I thought, okay, what's he doing other than coaching basketball? You know, it's very typical that, you're, that your coach is your history teacher or something along those lines. Coach Loy was a guidance counselor. And I thought, that's an interesting combination. That's, you know, I immediately gained respect for the man because I knew as a guidance counselor he had to be committed not just to kids as athletes, but to kids as people. And he was, he was committed to me as a player, but more importantly, he was committed to seeing me become a better person. And... You know, I would go to school, and during study hall, I would go into his office, and, you know, I would watch him. I would watch how he would scout opponents. I would, I would see the detail that, that he would put into his practice plans, for crying out loud. And the commitment that he put forth um, on a daily basis. But one of the biggest things to me that I noticed about him, I loved watching him interact with different people. Because Coach Loy had this ability to understand that every person had different characteristics. And what affects one person may not affect another. So while you need to yell at this kid to get him to respond, this kid here needs a little bit of love. And that commitment of getting to know each person individually was, was something that inspired me to want to wanna do what I do and to, to go into the education profession and to coach. And his personal commitment changed not just my life, but many many lives. One of them that I didn't know about, I got out some, some old articles, and uh, Triway basketball coach Ben Holt played for Coach Loy. And in one of the articles from 1994, um, Ben is quoted in there. And I thought, you know, what a small world. I didn't even recognize, I didn't know that, that he had played for him. And there's another example of a kid that's teaching and coaching. And, and I'm sure that Coach Loy had an impact on him. So, the power of personal commitment in people does two things, and we see these two things in people like Coach Loy and also Nehemiah. And I believe this is the first thing there for you, for you note takers. The power of personal commitment, it inspires greatness. You know, when you hear the word personal put into something, it reflects directly on you. And to commit means that you're making the decision to carry that out until completion. And when it's on you and the completed project is going to reflect you, it inspires you to do it right and to do it great. And then it also protects you from shortcuts because if you're in a position that pretty much everybody's going to look at and see it come back toward you, you are now in a position to where you're not going to quit. Okay, it takes quitting out of the equation. For Coach Loy, there was no plan B. He was a teacher or a counselor and a basketball coach. For my wife, Carol, and I, you know, one of the things that when we think of commitment, marriage, there's no plan B. You know, she's stuck for better or worse. And so, you know, it takes away the shortcuts. You're, you're going to do what you need to do to figure, to figure out how to get this taken care of. And unfortunately, not everybody does. In some cases, many people quit. Now the thing is, those that don't quit change the world. They change the world and the people that they're around. And they make an impact, just like Coach Lloyd, just like Nehemiah, that we're going to see in Scripture. So then that begs the question, why do people quit? If, if you can change the world, why do people quit? 
And I think the answer to that, and the problem is, sustaining commitment is really hard. Okay, when we start something, it's exciting. It's new. And you get into it for a few days or a few weeks, and, you know, I, I've taught for 22 years, and I, I still like the job, and I'm still excited. I'll guarantee you that when the first day of school rolls around, I'm not as excited as I was my first year because it's, it's older, okay? It's not new, and it's hard to maintain that personal commitment. So if we take a look at Scripture to find out you know, how did Nehemiah do this? Well, if we look at Nehemiah 1.4, and we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, it says, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And when you think about that, you see someone that cares so much about something well, what are they doing? He's giving us the first key to sustaining personal commitment. How do we do that? We model it. We model it. We, we, we see people that have something that they care so much about. They don't hide it. They let everyone know that they care about what they're, about what they're talking about. You know, Nehemiah, he had, he, he experienced the dislocated heart for the situation, wept and fasted, prayed for four months, and through that, he allowed God to work through that time with God. His passion for the given circumstances showed just how much it meant to him. So he modeled it. Anybody that looked at Nehemiah knew what this meant to him. And if we continue into Scripture, in Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18, it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. So, Nehemiah, in this situation, in spite of what the king, or in spite of, of going to the king and with, with great risk, um, he did it. And then he went to the people with great enthusiasm. And it's through that that we get the second part of what it means to sustain personal commitment. Ask for it specifically. Go to God and say, you know, where do I need to push into this life? Nehemiah didn't back away from a situation that God had laid on his heart just because he knew it was going to be difficult. He knew it was going to be hard. And we're going to see some things about this when we get into chapter 3 here in just a few moments that is going to show just how hard. And, you know, he knew that difficulty would lie in his path but he also knew, just like Pastor Tim's preached on over the last few weeks, that when he went to God, God would be behind him, pushing him through it. He would have God on his side, and God would be faithful through that. Now, we have a, a, a slide here, a picture, to give a little bit of a visual. Here's Jerusalem. Okay, now... There are a couple of things to know or that we know about Jerusalem. Number one, it's a large city. It's got a, a lot of roads that converge um, in and out. It required many gates. And the wall, you know, when you look at that wall, when, when you hear someone say that they were going to rebuild a wall, um, I know when I saw that visual, that was a little bit more in depth of a wall than, than Scott was thinking and, and, you know, being a willing participant in helping to rebuild. Um, and you know, those walls have to be taller and thicker from a military perspective so that soldiers can stand guard to defend against attack. They can, they can defend the gates. Um, in some places, you can see you've got towers standing to protect the gates as well uh, for the guards to, to stay up on. And uh, 
But in times of peace, these gates were hubs of activity. Um, you had counsel that might be held at those gates. You've got people passing in and out. You've got shopkeepers that are setting up. And so building these walls wasn't just important from a military perspective. It was important from a commerce and a trade perspective as well. These were important. If this was a very important task, and it was something that had to be done and done well. So if we take a look, I'm not, we're not going to go through the entire chapter. I'm going to share a part of Nehemiah chapter 3, and we're going to go through verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to uh, add in a couple others that help us understand how Nehemiah kept this attitude of personal commitment moving forward. So in Nehemiah 3, 1 through 5, it says, Eliashib, the high priest and his fellow priests, went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshalem, son of Barakiah, the son of Meshezabel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Bana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Now, those first five, you know, when you look at the names and so forth, can be a little bit hard to follow. So if we give another visual here, this is kind of a map, and if we were to turn the TV up, this is north and south, so the visual that we're used to having is up and down, but we've got north here, south down here, and right off the bat, we see that scripture started at the sheep gate, right here, and one of the most important pieces of information that we can take from that is look at who started the work, Eliashib and priest, a high priest. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever been involved in a situation to where the people in authority just barked out instruction and never really put their hand to the work. But if you've ever been involved in that, it probably didn't end that well. If it did end, it may not have been to the level that, um, you know, it could have been completed. But in this situation, the leaders led. And that's right out of the gate in chapter 3, one of the biggest pieces of information to realize because the leaders showed the way they showed how to get this started and they were the ones that put their hands to the work now pastor tim has mentioned that the old testament sometimes can be a turnoff because of the uh, names and some of the things that that you're reading about and i mentioned a few minutes ago how excited i was when we talked about you know he said hey you're this, it's gonna, the message is on personal commitment. I'm like, yes, I've got this. And then got off the phone with him, started to prepare, prayed, opened up the Bible, and read that. And I said, what in the world did Tim do to me? I mean, the names, Eliashib, I, I, and I'm impressed. I didn't really stutter a whole lot through those. Um, Zakur, Imri, Hassane, Merimoth, Uriah, Hakaz, Meshalem, Barakiah. I think I said that name like eight different times from the time that I started preparing for this. And then I looked and I'm like, they were working on the sheep gate and the fish gate and the valley gate. And I heard Pastor Tim talk last week about the dung gate. And I started thinking, I was like, how in the world am I supposed to put this to personal commitment? And so I sat down and, and, and I prayed about some things and I thought, you know what? I, I, rem I do remember, though, in small group, we're learning the story through Scripture. Now, 
I teach, and in my teacher textbooks, I've got notes written all over them, sticky notes, pen written in them. Whoever gets these books, if they get them after I retire, they're going to get all kinds of information from Scott in these textbooks. And yet in my Bible, I wasn't doing that until a few years ago. I thought, you know what? I'm going to use this thing just like I do my textbook. I'm going to write all over this. I'm going to make it mean something to me. And in small group, we're trying to story through Scripture. And if you've tried that in your small group, um, you may have struggled early on, but with practice, it does become easier. Um, now, if you haven't tried it, or let's say you're not even in a small group yet, little side note, you don't know what you're missing, get in one, okay? I absolutely love my small group and the people that are in it, and we have a blast, and, you know, get that on your Connect card and get into a small group. You will not regret it. But it's kind of comical to me during small group when our leader will look at us and, and we get to that part of the Bible storying and he asks for somebody to volunteer to do it and we all turn into middle school students. We look straight down <laughs> as if he can't see us anymore. And then, you know, you, you sit there and you're waiting and nobody's volunteered yet and someone very excitedly goes, oh, okay, I'll try it. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's kind of where I went when I looked at this. I thought, hold on a minute. What if I, sto what if I try to turn this into a story that, that Scott can understand? And when I did that, I thought, okay, hold on a minute. We're going to go back. Tim's preached on Nehemiah the entire time. This all started with one guy. So we've got one guy that was, was moved by something so much that he gathered a whole bunch of people so that they could complete a job. That's, that's pretty much the gist of what we've got here. And through this, they had to identify individual strengths and weaknesses. You know, some people, through this scripture, it talks about they rebuilt. So they were able to take something that was broken, use what's still broken, but rebuild it. Others went straight from scratch, and they started building from the ground up. Um, you know, he had to identify what they were good at, what they were not good at, and the cool thing about it, too, was, was it was people from all different types of backgrounds that came together for a common cause, okay? And, and I see that here. Pastor Tim has said, that, you know, we're, we're just a mixed bag of nuts here. And, and that's what we, this is what you had. You had, a, you had a mixed bag of nuts that came together to do what that picture of Jerusalem just showed you. And that was a pretty big job. So, you know... Nehemiah modeled it, and he asked for it specifically. But that's not something that's going to, you know, you can model, you can ask for it. Doesn't mean it's going to necessarily be carried out to fruition. So what do we do? Well, step three, sustaining personal commitment. You create an environment to sustain it. And Nehemiah did that. You know, he got a bunch of people to carry out this task by identifying strengths and weaknesses, but I think it's key that we remember what time we're in as well, okay, and what the task at hand was, because this was a group of people that came from around the area. You know, we said that Jerusalem's a big city. We've got people traveling from around the area, and the varying distances, if we put it into mileage that we'll understand, the varying distances were between 26 and 6 miles, 26 and 6 miles. So now, New Hope is 14 miles from my house up the road in Creston. And it takes me 22 minutes to get here by Honda Civic. They weren't in a Honda Civic. Okay? They were walking or riding a donkey. 26 or 6 miles. So, if we put that into terms, I love Google Maps because I, I Googled from New Hope. The farthest traveler was walking or riding a donkey up past my house in Creston all the way up to Interstate 76 in Seville. The shortest traveler was going from New Hope to Planet Fitness. Okay? And what were they traveling for? What were they getting when they got there? They were getting instruction to build a wall. Now, I'm not sure about you, but if I walk from here to Planet Fitness. I'm not even going to 76. I don't know that getting instruction to build a wall is exactly what I'm excited to hear about. But 
So how in the world did Nehemiah do it? Okay, how did he create a sustainable environment? Create an environment to sustain it. All right, it, uh, that sounds easy, but when you're looking at it in that perspective, I don't know how easy that would be considered. All right, so if we continue and we take a look in Nehemiah 3.10, it says, adjoining this, Judea, son of Haramaph, some more names for me, made repairs opposite of his house. Now, this project, that map that I had up just a, a couple of minutes ago, this, pro, this included 40 projects and 40 to 45 work groups. 40 projects, 40 to 45 work groups. Nehemiah had a very systematic and organized plan, just like Pastor Tim talked about last week, and he had the approach to get this done right, and here's how he did it. Verse 10 gives us a subtle yet important understanding of how he created that environment. Look at where this person is working, opposite of his house. Now, if something has to be done in front of my house or across the street from my house, opposite of my house, and I'm in charge of it, I'm probably going to look to do a good job. And I'm probably going to want, especially when you're looking at what we said this was for. This is military and commerce and, and protection and so forth, repairing the wall and the gates. And I'm probably going to make sure I do a good job. It's going to inspire me to greatness, just like we talked about earlier, and it's going to remove shortcuts. And Nehemiah did that by putting these people by their own home. And, you know, I would think that if I had to do it in front of your house, I would do a good job, but if I'm being honest and my human nature kicks in, am I really going to do as good of a job in front of your house as I'm going to do in front of mine? Probably not. Nehemiah knew that, and he created an environment so that he was personally committed, but it made these people personally committed as well. And by doing that, the job would get done and done well and done correctly. And then if we continue, into 312, it says, Shalem, son of Halohesh, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. And then it continues even further down in 320. It says, next to him, Baruch, son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section. Now, I teach math, so I had to look up zealously. <laughs> zealously is with great energy and enthusiasm. They traveled 26 miles or six miles or somewhere in between. They got the instruction. They identified strengths and weaknesses. And then they did this with great energy and enthusiasm. Now, the one prior talked about working with a daughter. These people had relationship, okay? Pastor Tim, every Sunday, welcomes us to the living room. And we want New Hope Church to be a place where everybody feels comfortable and, and everybody feels welcome, and it's a relational environment. And the cool thing about this is, is we see relational environments throughout Nehemiah chapter 3. We see priests, goldsmiths, perfume makers, rulers and their sons, daughters, temple servants, and merchants all working together, all working together. But I don't know if you noticed, back in verse 5, and I kept going, and it said in verse 5, the men of Tekoa are repairing a section, and Scripture states, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work. The nobles would not put their shoulders to the work. Now, it's important to realize these are the only people that are mentioned that didn't do the work, that didn't get to it, just like Eliashib and the high priest. So if they didn't do the work, why are they mentioned? And, you know, I look at it and I think, well, we said at the beginning that people quit. They back out of personal commitment. Why do people quit? because of opposition because things get hard these guys didn't want to do the work now here's the cool thing about it though I said that happened in verse 5 
Chapter 3 is 32 verses long. It didn't stop at chapter 5. Nehemiah didn't back out of personal commitment because some people weren't putting their shoulder to the work. He pushed through because he knew this was God's calling. And from verse 5 through verse 32, the work continues. And that commitment is still there. And the entire rebuilding project, it was so cool because it took place with amazing timing. I mean, when you, when you look, again, at the time frame and the size and the scope of what was going on, it took place with unbelievable leadership. And it took place, most importantly, with amazing faith. And all of it was led by a guy who allowed a dislocated heart to let God plant the seed of purpose. And through that purpose came this amazing personal commitment that he wanted to push into. Now, here's the question. When was the last time you were as moved as Nehemiah? And possibly an even bigger question, you know, I don't even like turning on the news anymore. We live in a world that is so negative, and it's, it's hard to personally commit because of how much opposition there is in the world. A bigger question to me is, is do you believe that this type of passion and call to purpose still exists today? And if you do, are you willing to push into it? Are you willing to go through all of the opposition? And here's the thing. These names that are mentioned, all of these names that I go through and have a hard time um, you know, pronouncing and so forth, all of those names, where are they? They're in the Bible. They matter. Every single one of those names matters. They mattered to God. And, you know, we try to take this scripture and we apply it to today. Well, what does that mean? That means you matter to God. That means that you are important to our Heavenly Father. And that, the question then becomes, do you believe that? You know, it, the, the next part of it is, you belong. And, and I can't begin to tell you how many stories my wife Carol and I have heard through the growth track. And I was so glad when we got the shirts um, with the new logo on the back and so forth, we brought back the No Perfect People Allowed because that makes it so easy to invite people here. I've had, I've had friends come because they hear that and they don't feel intimidated. They feel like they're going to be accepted. They feel like they're going to belong. And every time we go through the growth track, we hear stories from people talking about that. We just love it because we feel like we fit in. Just like these people did in that group, um, you know, working together. I jokingly, well, kind of half jokingly, tell people that, you know, our small group bounces around and we live up in Creston. We hosted one time and all of our small group came up and after visiting our house and leaving, they didn't kick us out. They still, they still kept us in it. So we, we belong. We, we matter, okay? We, the, to that group of people, okay, um, we have to matter. And God has moved in so many people. The stories that we have right now happening here at New Hope are, are awesome. And God is moving, but it's our desire to see that continue to happen. And the only way that that can continue to happen is if we're willing to sustain personal commitment. If we're willing to do what Nehemiah did here, allow holy ambition to move us okay to a dislocated heart to connect with God so that God can give us a radical faith and then we can move into having a strategic plan and then carry that out to completion because we know that it's God working through us just like Nehemiah did by modeling it you know he was enthusiastic with what he did so much so that he got everyone involved to be enthusiastic so he modeled it he asked for it specifically went to the king in spite of great risk and then after doing that created that 
environment to sustain it. And by doing so, that picture that we saw of Jerusalem, they were able to, they were able to, to rebuild that wall. They were able to carry out that holy ambition. And we have to be willing to let God inspire us to greatness by asking him specifically for the things in our life that he wants us to move in. A lot of times, you know, I find myself in my prayer life being very vague and, and thanking God for blessings and so forth. But I've got to remember to always push into that next question and ask him specifically, where do you want me to move? And then not just being willing to ask, but then being able to be quiet and listen. And we may not get the answer immediately. We may not always get the answer we want to hear. But being able to listen to what God is telling us to do and move into that. We always end with challenges. And to me, when I look at this, the first general challenge is, you know, we just wrapped up uh, Super Bowl Sunday. We had the partners meeting here. We had the, the game on the big screens. And we wrapped up the 21 days of prayer and fasting. During that time, if you're like me and you participated in it, you made personal commitments. You pushed into something that would feed your spirit by removing something maybe physical. You know, whether it was a food or whatever. And what happens is, as we get to the end of that 21 days of prayer and fasting, we have this party and our human nature kicks in and we view it in our minds as we just crossed the finish line. We're done with our prayer and fasting. So give me a Reese's cup or whatever it was that I didn't have. And now that personal commitment that we found again, so many stories of through the growth track and so forth or just in conversation out in the cafe. Think about yourself. If you've heard a story or told a story about what you experienced during that 21 days of prayer and fasting. We, we talk about it and then we get to the finish line, we have the Super Bowl party and we move on. And now the growth is only taking place on Sundays when we're here and we leave and then we get into the rest of the week and we don't push into something that we, we need to have a better understanding and a better reminder of. God commits to be with us every single day. It doesn't have to be the 21 days of prayer and fasting. God commits to be with us every single day. Why don't we make the personal commitment to be with him every single day? That's the general. And then the more personal challenge question would be what is in the way of you making a personal commitment to your holy ambition? What's in the way of you making a personal commitment? Is it the fear of the word commitment and understanding that once I do that, I'm saying I'm going to see it out to completion? What is that Thing that's keeping you from committing and being like Nehemiah, modeling, asking, and creating that environment to sustain that so that you can see God work in and around you and make the world a better place and grow God's kingdom here. That's what we want to see continue to work and push into here at New Hope. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for this church, for these people, and for using Nehemiah as the example of what it means to travel this journey of personal commitment so that we can learn from Nehemiah, we can learn from your scriptures, God, and more importantly, we can apply it to our lives. God, I pray that you would help us to remove the distractions in our daily lives that keep us from making a personal commitment to you. I pray that we would set aside time, God, to be with you every day. You commit to us. Help us commit to you. Help us commit to our holy ambitions and help us
to not just spend time talking to you, but listening to you as well, God. Help us to hear your voice. Give us clarity so that we can see the path that you're laying out for us, God, to carry out our personal commitments and to grow your kingdom here in our community. I pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.